So this is College Admissions 101, which is the very first QuestCast in our QuestBridge College Admissions Summer Series. And then our panelists today, uh, well, I'll quickly introduce myself. So my name is Marla Ross. I work on the high school programs team here at QuestBridge, and I'm also a QuestBridge alum. So it's very rewarding for me to get to work here. And I also remember how confusing it was navigating the college admissions process the college admissions and the QuestBridge National College match process. So I hope today's QuestCast can help clear some things up. And then joining me today for the second half of the session will be two recent high school graduates and 2020 National College match scholarship recipients, Malik and Sharina. They have a lot of great insight, so I'm excited for you to hear from them. They'll join on camera to introduce themselves and share about their experiences once we've covered the first half of the session. So before we begin, I wanna give you a quick overview of QuestBridge for those of you who may be unfamiliar, who may be new or unfamiliar with the organization. So our mission at QuestBridge is to help bright, motivated students from low-income backgrounds navigate college admissions, access the nation's top colleges, and have additional opportunities after college graduation. QuestBridge was founded in 1994 in Palo Alto, California, and to date, 70,000 students have been served by our programs. 27,000 college students have been admitted to a QuestBridge College partner. And there are 15,000 QuestBridge scholars and alumni nationally. So today we'll start by covering some common general college admissions terms that you'll encounter as you begin to apply to college. And then we'll go through a few terms specific to the National College Match, which is QuestBridge's, QuestBridge's admi college admissions process. After that, we'll hear from Malik and Sharina about their experiences applying to college through the National College Match. And we'll finish with dedicated time for you all to ask Malik and Sharina questions about their college admissions experiences. So before we begin, I wanna show you how you can access our college admissions glossary, which is found on our website. So if you visit our website at questbridge.org um, and then go over to the left side, there's a tab called high school students. So you'll hover over that and then go all the way to the right to the student resource center. And there's a link you can click, which is applying for college. That's where you'll find several different resources, including this list of general college admissions terminology, as well as QuestBridge specific terminology, some of which we'll be covering today. So here you can see, you'll be taken to this landing page, applying for college, and down at the bottom is the college admissions glossary. Let's see if I can quickly, at the end of the session, I'll chat uh, links where you can access that glossary as well as a few other important links that we'll talk about today. So let's start with some general college admissions terms. So starting off is the Common Coalition and Universal Application. And these are names you'll want to be familiar with as you begin app to apply for college. They're standardized college application forms accepted by many colleges. Um, and they do differ between colleges, so not all colleges accept the Common App and vice versa, not all colleges accept the Coalition App. Um, it varies by college, so it's important to know which applications the colleges you're interested in accept. Another term that may come up frequently, particularly in the context of early decision and applying through the National College Match, which we'll discuss later, is binding admission. So binding admission requires students to withdraw all other applications and attend the college if admitted. Um, as I just mentioned, this agreement is seen in early decision applications and in binding QuestBridge College partners for the match. So there's a couple of different college admissions processes that you may or may not be familiar with, but the first one we'll cover today is early action. So early action is a non-binding admissions process that allows students to apply to a college early in November. Typically the admissions decision is given in December and the student is offered admission 
denied admission, or deferred during this time. Single choice early action is a variant of early action, and we'll cover that definition right now. So this is a non-binding early application option, also known as restrictive early action, and students can only apply to one of these programs as their early application. So it differs slightly from early action because it is restricted to just one of these programs. And something to note about both of these processes is that they are non-binding. So you are not required to attend if you are admitted. Um, and this differs from early decision, which we'll talk about next. So early decision is a binding admissions process that allows students to apply to, to a college early. Students are only allowed to apply to one college early decision since it is binding, and they are obligated to attend that college if they are accepted. In addition, some schools offer two early decision rounds called early decision one and early decision two. So early decision two offers a slightly later timeline for applying and hearing back typically around the same time as regular decision. But similarly, it is a binding process. Another admissions process that's not quite as common, but still important to know is rolling admission. So instead of waiting to judge all applications concurrently, colleges that offer rolling admission will review applications and determine acceptance status as applications are sent in. Um, so it is, again, not as common as other types of applications, but it's out there, so it's important to know. And then regular decision is probably the most commonly known college application process. So it's the normal college application process by which students apply by published dates, their applications are reviewed, and they typically hear back about decisions in the spring. And we'll go over a timeline in a bit for when each of these rounds occurs. Uh, before we do that, however, I want to introduce you to a few terms um, that are relevant to know. So one is a likely school. So this is a college where, based on the average GPA and test scores of accepted students, the likelihood of being admitted is very high. So this is a school where you can feel pretty confidently based on your own academic performance um, that you will, you have a very high likelihood of being admitted. A target school differs slightly. So it's a college where based on the average GPA and test scores of accepted students, admission is likely, uh, but you may not be quite as confident about your chances of being admitted at a target school. And then finally, another common term you'll hear is a reach school. So this is a college where admission might be more difficult or competitive based on the average GPA, test scores of accepted students, and the college's overall admission requirements. So um, something to note is that Questbridge College Partners, which we'll talk about in a little bit, are highly selective and are considered reach schools for most students. So keeping, in that, keeping that in mind, we encourage students to apply to a number of likely target and reach schools um, just to be safe. And this is generally a, a widely accepted ideal situation for most students is to apply to a number of likely target and reach schools in each category. So we're not going to go too deeply into financial aid for today's Questcast. Um, we'll have a Questcast in two weeks called Debunking the Sticker Price of a Top College, which will feature a panel of financial aid representatives from Questbridge College Partners, and we'll dive deeper into financial aid at top colleges. However, these are two very common financial aid terms that are important to know as you begin your college application journey. So the first one is the FAFSA called the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, but it's commonly known as the FAFSA. And it's a free application form that students submit to apply for federal financial aid. It's required for all students who are seeking federal student grants, work study programs, and loans, and may also qualify you for state-sponsored financial aid, depending on the state you're applying through or applying in. The next one that you will probably hear about is the CSS profile. So most, this is a, an additional financial aid application used by some colleges, typically private colleges, to award their own financial aid funds. And so most Questbridge College partners require the CSS profile in addition to the FAFSA. So that's something to be aware of. So 
So now we'll go through a typical college admissions timeline, um, just keeping in mind that the dates will vary school by school. So it's important to keep tabs on all the deadlines for the colleges you're interested in. So in late summer or early fall is when applications typically open. So may, some applications may be open already, but most will open in the late summer or early fall. Then in mid-October to mid-November, this is when early decision and or early applications are typically due. Then in early December, ad early admission decisions are typically released. So that's when you'll hear back one way or the other about early decision. Then in December through January, this is when regular decision as well as early decision two applications are due. So as mentioned, in addition to regular decision applications, there may be early decision two rounds that are happening simultaneously. Um, early decision two applications are typically due in early January with similar or the same deadlines as regular decision, but they have binding admission and an earlier notification date in late January or early February, whereas regular decision, as we covered earlier, is non-binding. Then in mid-March to late April, this is when regular decision admission decisions are released. And then after decisions are released for regular decisions, students typically have about one to one and a half months, typically until May 1st, to decide where to enroll. And at this point, financial aid packages should be released as well, which can help students in making their decisions. So now let's go through some QuestBridge specific terms. So we'll be covering a few college admissions terms relevant to the national college match in QuestBridge specifically. However, there's a lot of information we don't cover in this QuestCast. So for a deep dive into the national college match, including the application, eligibility, and timeline, um, you can join us in early August for a dedicated quest cast on the National College Match. And I do encourage you to join that if you're interested, um, because it'll be a lot more in depth than what we're going to cover today. So the first term that's relevant to know is the National College Match application. So the National College Match is an admissions process and the application is a unique application through QuestBridge that allows students to apply to 45 college partners. And these college partners are 45 of the top colleges in the nation that have partnered with QuestBridge and are committed to supporting high achieving, low income students. Uh, additionally, they're dedicated to meeting 100% of demonstrated financial need, which is why they partner with QuestBridge. So the National College Match, as mentioned, is a college admission as well as a scholarship application process that helps high achieving low income high school seniors gain early admission and full four year scholarships to the nation's most selective colleges. Uh, keeping in mind, it is a binding admissions process for the most part, except for one of our college partners, which is non-binding, um, but it is both an admissions and a scholarship application process. A term that if you do, look more into the national college match that you may hear often is finalist. So a finalist, a national college match finalist is a student who is selected by QuestBridge as a competitive applicant for the match and our college partners. So finalists are eligible to be considered for early admission and a match scholarship to our college partners. And we'll go through a timeline of when you'll find out whether you're a finalist versus when you find out about the match scholarship. So the match is the process of ranking schools to be admitted early to, Questbridge, to a QuestBridge College partner with a full four-year scholarship. So the match, as I just mentioned, is a binding admissions process. So if you are matched, you are committed to attending that institution if you choose to rank schools. Then the next term you may hear is the QuestBridge National College Match Scholarship. So sometimes this is just referred to as the match scholarship, and it's a full four year scholarship for match students worth over $200,000. Our college partners use their own funds, so the funds don't come from QuestBridge. Um, they use their own funds as well as state and federal aid 
to cover the full cost of tuition, room and board, books and supplies, and travel. All match scholarships are loan free and require no parental contribution. They may contain a student contribution in the form of work study, summer work, or student savings, um, but no parental contribution and no loans. And something to note is that our two panelists that are joining today both received match scholarships from their respective respective institutions during last year's National College Match application cycle. So the last terms we'll cover is ranking colleges. So this is the process through which students submit a list of quest for, to, a, a list to Questbridge of up to 12 college partners that they wish to be considered for early admission through the match. And students are able to rank up to 12 colleges in their preferred order of consideration and match with their highest ranked choice that also wants to match with them. So it is an early binding admissions process. However, the difference is that through the National College Match, you can apply for early admission at up to 12 schools as opposed to just one school, as well as knowing that you'll have full, a full four-year scholarship if you match. And then the last process is QuestBridge regular decision. So this is the process through which finalists who are not matched can apply for free to any of the 45 QuestBridge college partners. Um, and though, although the match scholarship is not offered through the QuestBridge regular decision, because our college partners are committed to meeting 100% of demonstrated financial need, financial need, finalists can still receive generous financial aid if they're admitted. Admissions decisions and financial aid packages for QuestBridge regular decision are released by college partners in the spring. And I can attest to this, I applied through QuestBridge regular decision back in my day, still received a really great financial aid package, although I did not match. Um, but we'll be covering the national college match, everything that goes into that again at our QuestCast in August. So stay tuned for more information on that. Um, so, we do, we're gonna go through a quick timeline. This is not an in-depth timeline that will be covered in the national, the dedicated national college match quest cast, um, but I'll just go through it quickly to kind of compare to a typical college admissions timeline. So in a few weeks, the national college match application will open in late summer. And again, the application is an online free application. The application deadline is September 28th. Um, which is a little bit earlier than other typical application deadlines. Then by October 14th, uh, students can rank up to 12 college partners that they would like to consider their application. So October 14th, September 28th this year, typically it's late September, mid-October each year. And so when students rank colleges, this is when they enter the early part of our process with the possibility of being matched or admitted early to a college partner with a full four-year match scholarship. Then in mid to late October, we notify uh, students who have been selected as finalists, and those who are selected as finalists will have their applications forwarded to the schools they ranked. Then in addition to students' QuestBridge applications in, on November 1st or early November, students have to submit additional materials to the pro college partners that they rank. And then in early December, often like the first week of December, match scholarship recipients are notified. And students, again, can only be matched with one school, which is the highest school that, which is the school that students ranked highest that also wants to admit them with the match scholarship. Then if matched, students are good, they're good to go. They're admitted early December in early December with a full four-year scholarship. But if not, that's okay. Um, they are students who do not match are deferred, not rejected from the colleges they ranked. And so non-matched finalists are able to review potential early admission opportunities and next steps from the schools that they ranked. They're also able to apply through QuestBridge regular decision at this point. Um, to additional schools. So similar to the typical college admissions timeline, colleges will review all the applications they have received throughout the winter through regular decision. And then in March and April, regular decision acceptances and financial aid packages will be sent out by our college partners. Then in the following fall, all finalists admitted to QuestBridge College Partners, either through the match or through QuestBridge regular decision, get to join the QuestBridge Scholars Network 
which are student groups on each of our college partner campuses that can provide a great resource to students as they enter college. So I know that's a lot. Again, join us in early August for our in-depth National College Match Questcast, um, but that's just a brief overview of our college admissions timeline. Okay, so now I'm going to invite Malik and Sharina on to introduce themselves. Uh, and we'll get started with a few questions that we've selected that we wanna talk about regarding the college admissions process. And then we'll go into live Q&A where you can ask your questions. So Sharina, would you like to go first to introduce yourself? Yeah, so um, my name is Sharina Johnson. I, my pronouns are she, her, and I was born in Frankfurt, Germany, but I live in Orlando, Florida. And the college that I'm attending in the fall is Rice University. Great. Malik, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, hey, my name's Malik Ramadanovich. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And my hometown is Durham, North Carolina, and I'll be attending Davidson College in the fall. Great, thank you. Um, so my first question for you both is, what was the structure of your school environment this past year? Malik, if you wanna to speak to that first. Yeah, so my school district um, stayed online pretty much all year. They opened up back in person um, for the last two months, but that meant that in the fall, my whole Quest Bridge process and college application process was all online and by myself. Thank you. Sharina, how about you? Yeah, so my school gave us a choice of either being all in person or all online, and I just chose to be all online all year. Thank you. I'm sure many students who are attending this class can, can understand that or can relate. Um, so my next question is, what was your support system like during this time? So how did you stay on track without the support of in-person schooling? Sharina, I don't know if you want to speak to that first. Yeah, so I mostly communicated with my counselor through email. So I had to like collect all of the emails or all the questions that I had like ahead of time and I had to email him, but it was a little bit harder to do because sometimes he would see the emails, sometimes he wouldn't. So it was like, always having to follow up and making sure like, oh, did you, could you answer this question or could you answer that question? But I did a lot of research of how the application process went on my own. I feel like that helped a lot. Yeah. Um, how about you, Malik? How did you stay on track and what was your support system like? Um, it was pretty independent because my guidance counselor didn't know much about the Quest Bridge process. Um, but to help with that, I talked to a lot of my friends and acquaintances about their college apps. And it's really nice to find a like fellow college app buddy that you can contact and help each other read each other's essays and uh, like relay questions and answers off of. Um, and then I also gained a lot of organizational skills since I was independent, um, including like keeping a running tab in my notes on my phone of questions about certain applications or the QuestBridge process so that I wouldn't forget about them um, using the calendar app. Um, and we had a college advisor and a liaison that really helped, but also just try to find like a student help center or like college admissions help center in your city because we also had one of those. Um, and then my biggest tip was that with the world of TikTok and social media now is me and my friends created a shared photo album and we saved TikToks related to the college application process and like moving into college, I'm still using the same photo album and you can just um, keep all the like information in one place and that really helped. There's also a few accounts on TikTok um, that help with college applications and just make sure you follow and like them so that they keep showing up on your page. Um, and then one I could reference is Gohar's Guide. Um, and I think I'll try to drop that in the chat if I can. Let me know if you're not able to chat and I can enable it, but um, that's great advice. I know we're working on getting some TikToks out 
here at QuestBridge. I'm not sure if that's in the cards for us, but as Malik mentioned, there's a lot of great college application TikToks and other online resources out there. So that's great advice. Thank you. Um, my next question is pivoting a little bit beyond resources, but I know it was a particularly challenging year last year. How did you convey your activities, your academics, or any other unique circumstances arising from the pandemic? Um, Malik, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, of course. So I found that a lot of the clubs that I had been doing before COVID hit um, was very in-person and active, but we couldn't do them in COVID, of course. So just try to join your school or community um, organizations that meet online or can meet with even against COVID. So that's what I did. Um, a lot of things that you think might not go on your applications or fit to your applications really do if you enjoy them and you spend time on those activities. So just try to um, make use of online stuff as well. There's a lot of online community service you can do. That's awesome. And then a quick follow-up question before I turn to Sharina. Um, did you use the additional information sections throughout the application to explain any potential gaps in your application from the pandemic? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, in the QuestBridge application, uh, after each section, there's a little additional info box to explain further and make sure you use that to really make sure that the people reading your application at QuestBridge and your colleges that you're applying to when they read your application, they can see um, how those certain sections apply to you and your family specifically. Great, thank you. Um, and then Sharina, I'll ask you the same question. How did you convey your activities, academics, any other unique circumstances arising from the pandemic within your application? Yeah, so I have like a couple programs where I did like, you know, like I was in it all three years and then I have to stop because of the pandemic. So I definitely use the additional info section to show that, you know, I still have these interests. It's just, I couldn't participate in it because um, of the pandemic. So a lot of um, admissions counselors like really like to see that you were passionate about a certain thing. So like if you weren't able to like do something that you really, really like to do, then just put it in the additional info section because then it shows to them that you still have these interests, but it's just outside influences don't let you do that. So I definitely just made use of that. That's great. I'm glad to hear. Yeah, I think some, some can be wary of filling out those boxes or you may not understand how to use them, but I, in any application, not just the QuestBridge application, if there's an opportunity um, to share any additional information arising from circumstances, particularly given this last year, I think that's always a great opportunity to explain anything. Thank you, Sharina. Um, so the next question is, I know both of you were attending school virtually, and so, and a lot of college campus visits were shut down during this time. So how did you go about researching colleges and for the National College Match specifically, determining rankings in this virtual environment? Sharina, would you like to start? Yeah, so I definitely made use of virtual college fairs because at that time when the application season like started, I had just started like opening up to the idea of like going out of state because before I was really only looking at Florida schools and I wasn't really like super sure about going out of state. So I kind of just took, um, took advantage of those virtual like opportunities just to see like what's out there like what they have to offer like just um get more insight about out of state but I definitely looked at like the school's websites and talked to the admissions counselors and like just to get an idea of like whether or not I would fit in with the school or not that's great advice the websites are a great untapped resource I would say um, Malika, I know you had shared, you also used websites as well as other resources. Um, so how did you go about determining, researching colleges or determining rankings? 
Yeah, a lot of the stuff that Sharina mentioned. So um, first I attended my school's virtual college visits. Um, they don't provide very detailed information, but they help you get an idea of which colleges you will like and which you won't because they just go over those fast facts about each college. And then again, to just get a general idea of the college environment and what they put their priorities to and everything. Um, there's certain websites that have each college's information, whether they're a big school or a small school, private, public, what the party scenes like, what the academics are like and all that kind of stuff. Um, one big one is called College Niche. I think that's our college niche, however you pronounce it. And I'll drop that in the chat when I'm done speaking. But um, also, again, those individual college websites, um, every college website should have their um, programs, their majors, uh, the, the school environment, what the community's like, the clubs that are available there. So make sure you go to each school's website and really do a good search. Yeah, definitely. Malika, I think I mentioned this to you at a different point, but um, I used college niche as well. I remember looking at specifically, they talked about the food on campus, like what's the meal plan like and how good is the food? So there's really categories for everything that you can find out there. And it's important when, when building your list. And I'll share the link again at the end. Actually, I'm gonna just stop sharing my screen quickly. And I'm gonna find this link for you because QuestBridge actually has, um, we just created a virtual events list of all these different virtual events hosted by QuestBridge College Partners that you can attend if you're interested in hearing more about QuestBridge College Partners specifically. So one second, I'm gonna chat that and then I'll continue. All right, I found it. <laughs> so if you go to that page, you can find a bunch of different college events that you can attend. But as Malik said, college events aren't necessarily everything. So in addition, I think looking at websites is always a great idea. Um, okay, so my final question before we go into live Q&A and start answering questions from our attendees is just how did you take care of yourself during this stressful time? and just how do you, do you have any advice for this year's applicants? I know college admissions is one of the most stressful times in, in a lot of people's lives. So any advice you can share, I think would be helpful. Malik, if you wanna start. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, me along with, or I along with a, a lot of my uh, peers really struggled this past year just because of the pandemic and everything kind of made college applications harder. I mean, they're usually very stressful anyways, but you know, recent situations have made it even harder. Um, and one of the biggest things I think that was a barrier was believing that the work I was putting towards applications like the essays um, and short answers and all that was not my best writing or my best work, um, which is not true because the most you can do or the best you can do during college app season, very stressful time anyways, is what you're gonna get done anyways. So you just gotta kind of look at it like what you're doing as your best work is your best work. You can't really push yourself further, any further than you can during college app season. And also I think another piece of advice I followed was just do not stress too much or overthink because you're probably underselling yourself in these applications. Um, just sell yourself, be confident, and really write about what you love and who you are. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I think you can get caught up in, in feeling very overwhelmed and feeling like you're you're not good enough um, as you're writing these, these applications. I know I felt that way, but definitely demonstrating interest to the best of your ability, talking about what you're passionate about, um, it goes a long way. And I think everyone feels similarly. Everyone feels, not everyone, but many people feel like they're not doing their best work because it's hard. Sharina, what about you? How did you take care of yourself and what would be some advice that you could give this year's applicants? Yeah, I definitely um, was really stressed during the application season, especially because I had like a lot of responsibilities because of the pandemic and it was like a really kind of like a weird time, but I kind of just took the application with like small steps so like I would focus on each section at a time, like just get this done 
today and then you'll get this done next week and you'll get this done next week. So I would probably start earlier um, if you were planning on doing it similar to that. But also just remember like whatever happens kind of just happens. Like um, even if you don't get your first choice in school, you're still gonna go somewhere. You're still gonna take those ideas and that creativity and you're gonna take it to the next school and you're still gonna do great there. So just remember that, I guess. I think that's great encouragement to share because I think it can feel like a co one college application is the end of the world, but there's so many different avenues uh, within this process. So thank you for sharing. Um, okay, so we're gonna move into open questions. Again, make sure your questions are relevant to the panelists. I see a lot of national college match questions, um, college admissions questions, which is great, but we wanna make sure the questions we're selecting today are for our panelists. So I did see one. Um, yeah, so I'm about to be a senior. Should I be visiting colleges already? Um, I don't know if you have any advice. Did you end up visiting any colleges, whether it was just on your own, not through an official college visit, or when did you start doing online tours and things like that? I don't know if either of you wants to jump in. Um, I actually did visit some local schools, like in person, um, when when it was like at the earlier area of like the application season. Um, there are a lot of like virtual college visits that you can do like online. Like if you go to their websites or if you just type in like the school that you wanna to go to and say virtual visit, then they'll have like a whole like pathway that you go through and it's like a whole bunch of like 360 photos. So I would definitely like take advantage of that because it can get you a good idea of like how your school looks like and they have like narrators that tell you like oh this is how many dining halls we have or like this is how many libraries we have so that's pretty interesting to go through very cool what about you malik did you do that any of that any just like in person but not really in person tours uh yeah definitely i actually only toured two schools and they were both local schools and they were during sophomore and junior year. So I actually didn't do the whole touring every school in the summer between before your senior year and all that stuff. Um, but I definitely feel like if you use your online resources enough, and like Sharina said, a lot of schools even do like virtual tours where you can kind of Google map your way through the school and you can see the campus. Um, yeah, just you can definitely find out a lot about a school without touring it, or even just trying to reach out to someone for a Zoom call or emailing um, someone in the admissions office, they can get you a lot of, or answer a lot of your questions. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think like you mentioned, it's never too early. So maybe some of you already have visited colleges, at least like local schools in sophomore or junior year, but definitely now's a great time to start visiting or doing virtual tours. Um, so the next one, I think students are just wondering how, how many colleges did you rank and, and why did you choose to rank that? Or like, how did you even go about making decisions on what schools you ranked? And I typed it in the chat as well. I guess I can start this one off. Um, my story is funny because I originally ranked seven schools, I believe, but I actually didn't submit all the materials for all seven schools, just my top four. Um, so when you get to that stage and the, the individual college materials or what QuestBridge calls the match requirements, when you get to that stage, if you don't submit them um, for those certain schools, of course, you're going to kind of get dropped from those schools. But I did submit the top four, uh, all of the requirements for my top four schools. And um, so in reality, I only ranked four schools and I got into my second choice, which I'm very happy about actually. Um, and yeah, you kind of just choose it based on what school do you really, really want to go to? Like your ultimate reach, that would be your number one. And then start rating the other ones in terms of maybe like how far away you are, um, the environment, just really weigh in all of the factors. Um, and yeah. I think that's good advice. Yeah, the good thing you pointed that out. Make sure for all the schools that you want to rank that you do submit the match requirements because those are important. But I'm glad it, it worked out. Um, Sharina, how about you? Did you 
have a particular process when you are ranking schools? Yeah, so I ranked three schools um, and Rice was my second choice. So I kind of just, because technically if you like rank the schools and you turn in all the um, application materials and all that stuff, and you do get like matched with one, you have to go to that one and like, it's like a binding decision. So I was kind of wary about putting like a whole bunch of schools down because I was like, I don't know if I really want to go to those schools. Like if I, I just felt like I didn't do enough research at that point. So I just, those three schools that I did research, I researched like really thoroughly. I made sure that like, if I was put in that, like put in that school, like I actually wanted to be there. So I think that's important to remember. Yeah, definitely. We covered that earlier. It is for the most part, except with the exception of MIT, um, the National College Match is binding. So you do want to be certain that you want to attend the schools that you apply for. So I'm glad you were cognizant of that um, when you submitted your list. Great. Well, thank you for that advice. And then the next question that I wanted to ask you both from one of the students is if you have any tips on how to write your personal statement and or essay. I'm sure you remember that. Well, maybe you don't, maybe you blocked it out, but <laughs> any tips that you would share on that? Yeah, it was a lot of essay writing because you have the QuestBridge essays and then for every school that you like list, there's like supplemental essays that you have to write like specifically for that school. And um, I think one of the important things to remember is that you don't really have to like write your entire life story. I think you hear a lot about this, like, oh, you have to like tell them like all the hardships that you've been through in your life. But just remember like to talk about things that you're actually passionate about too, like why you wanna go to school and like what you wanna study and all that stuff. I think that's really important to remember when you're writing. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's probably our most common essay tip that we give to students is like, you don't need to get everything out, just focus on one thing that's maybe important to you or important to your character. Um, what about you, Malik? Any additional advice? It's okay if yeah, you don't. Okay. <laughs> I think one of the biggest uh, pieces of advice when writing your personal statement is that you want to show how you have learned from what you wrote about or grown or changed or like how that impacted your life. Like a lot of people write a common app essay that's really, um, really common and they repeat every year and is even one of the QuestBridge uh, essays, one of the additional QuestBridge essays you'll have to do, which a future Quest class cast will talk about more in depth, is the same kind of question. It's write about an experience, something you experienced and how you personally grew from it. And in that essay and probably with, in response to any of the prompts, you want your first half of the essay being description or storytelling, and then the second half being how that really changed you or made you the person you are today. And that part will really show them how you've progressed or changed yourself, and that makes you an interesting candidate versus a, a story, but they don't really know, you know, what that story did to you, if that makes sense. <laughs> Well, it makes sense to me. So hopefully it makes sense to everyone else. I think that's a, a, another great piece of advice, right? As much as you can focus on, on telling how you grew from an event, um, I think is really a great, a great thing to read as a reader of applications. So I've only read a couple cycles of applications, but I think those are the essays that always really stand out to me are the students that are really able to write reflectively about experiences that they've had within those college essays. And we will, as Malik mentioned, um, later in the fall, we'll have a dedicated essay quest cast where we'll talk about all of our tips as readers, as QuestBridge staff for writing your essay. But it's great to hear from you too, as well, that that was your experience. Um, so the next question, we'll probably take one or two more questions, uh, but I think this is a great one, is did you know what you wanted to pursue or major in prior to the college application process? Or did you figure it out as you went along? I guess I can start this one. Um, I actually did not know what I wanted to major in at all. I applied undecided to Davidson College and I'm still undecided. 
And that's okay, because I just knew that I liked the college and that it's a liberal arts college. And a lot of these schools um, that are Crestbridge partners are liberal arts colleges, which means you can just explore just about everything um, in those. So yeah, you don't need to know exactly what you, what you wanted to do. Um, yeah. I think that's, that's great advice. If they were, the next part of that question is, if someone's unsure, what advice would you have? And I think like a major is very important if you know what you wanna do, but if you don't, there are other aspects as Malik mentioned earlier that you can look into when you're researching colleges that would be a good fit for you. One of those might be flexibility of major, um, but I would say most schools allow you to change your major too. So even if you were to apply with a specific major, that's not to say like, that's it for you typically you'll be able to change. Sharina, what about, did you know what you were gonna major in? Yeah, I definitely knew that I wanted to major in, I'm majoring in bioengineering. So um, like all throughout high school, I really liked STEM classes. So I definitely, I think it helps like maybe a bit, but I could understand like how, if you didn't know what you wanted to major in, like you could just still like, finish the application process and wouldn't really affect you as much but I mean if you do then definitely talk about it in your application like I talked a lot about like the, the topics that I want to research and just stuff within the field that I was interested in um but if you also if you don't specifically know like what particular major that you want to do like you can either you can even talk about topics that you just like learning about in school as well so, um, I mean, there's sure there's probably something that you like to learn about in school. So you could always talk about that in your applications as well, but I don't think it would affect you too much if you don't know the specific major. Yeah, I think that's good advice and good that you know both, right? So whether you know strongly what you wanna do, that can be a great avenue to research and apply, but if you don't, that's okay too, because you have other very interesting aspects of your personality, like Sharina mentioned, um, and your growth that are interesting beyond your major. Okay, so let me see. We, I think we have time for one more question. Um, yeah, so, oh, this is a good one. So do we have to be invited to visit a college or talk to an admissions officer, or can we reach out to them? Do either of you have experience reaching out? No. What, it was to like visit the college or? Yeah, did you, so did you have to have a special invitation to visit a college or talk to an admissions officer, or did you ever reach out specifically to admissions officers to schedule that or to talk to them? Yeah, so I definitely reached, reached out to them. All their like emails and all that stuff is like listed on their website and they're always pretty happy to help with any other questions that you have. And most schools, if you want to schedule a visit, they'll have like an area on their website that will be like, visit us. And then it's like, you click on it and then you like schedule an appointment. So I don't think that you have to be invited for any other schools that I know of. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a, a good point. Admissions officers are always happy to talk to you. So don't feel like you need to wait for an invitation. Um, and then this is just, since that was a short question, it was more of a clarifying question. I think we'll do one more. Um, and I'm interested to hear this as well. You both touched on it a little bit, uh, but what did, what were the factors that ultimately attracted you to your respective schools? I know that's a, <laughs> gotta think about it. <laughs> Thanks, Sharina. No worries. Um, I think one thing about Rice that I really liked was that the like the atmosphere is really like a collaborative atmosphere. Like a lot of the students that go there, they like really love helping each other, and they like aren't as cutthroat as like a lot of schools can be. So especially like top schools, like Crestbridge schools and Ivy Leagues. So if you're more into like, so I think I would definitely look at that aspect too, like how student life is, like, are you more like a co competitive kind of person or do you like working with others and like collaborating and stuff? So that is one of the biggest things that attracted me to Rice. 
I would say also the research aspect, um, the research that my department, like my major um, was conducting because a lot of the research that is done at Rice was something that I was interested in. So um, that's also something that you could look at if you know what major that you wanna go into. Did you want to add anything, Malik? Uh, yeah, from my school, it was very much like the school size and environment. Um, my school is a very small school. It's the same size as my high school, and I like that. I kind of want the same small school feel. And I heard that the community with the professors and the students was just very intimate and great. And you could just talk to your professor and be there in your small class sizes and it's not like a huge lecture with a hundred people. So you get that personal connection. And I really wanted that. So that was the main factor in choosing my schools. Yeah, that's great. I think it's great. You both had very different reasonings, but very strong reasonings for why you picked your schools. So I think that's great advice. I actually did want to ask you, I'm, I keep saying last question and then not giving you the last chance. But there was one I wanted to clarify because we we don't didn't cover it as much in the panel earlier, but I remember you both talked to me about it was, um, I think when explaining your activities section, were there any unusual activities you put in? Or I know some students are worried about lacking activities because of the pandemic. Was there a way that you encountered this or that you um, included other activities in addition to this? Or in, in addition to like, to traditional school extracurriculars? I definitely use, I don't know if, it, I don't remember if it was like a, I think it was together with the activity section, but there was like a family responsibilities like part of the application, which like I have to spend a lot of time um, babysitting my brothers because they're smaller, especially with online school because they were here a lot and both my parents were working more because of the pandemic. And I also had to take up an extra job because of the pandemic and stuff. So if you have those kind of like extra circumstances, like you can always put them in the family responsibilities part. And there's also another section to have like work experience. So it can show that you don't really have a lot of free time to do too many extracurricular activities like that are through your school. Yeah, that's great. That's great to point that out that you, you did that as well, because I do think QuestBridge, we do encourage you to, to use those sections. It's more seeing that you're using your time um, just to get an idea of what you use your time on outside of the classroom. And so those are very valuable experiences as well. If you're working, if you're you have significant home responsibilities. Um, those are important to include, not just like traditional extracurricular activities. Okay, all right, so that does wrap up our time. Um, thank you both so much, Malik and Sharina, for joining. I think it was very valuable to have both of your perspective and your experience. Um, so thank you again for taking the time to be here today. I'm going to finish up, so don't leave yet. I'm going to finish up with a few more slides. So you too, Malik and Trina, you're welcome to, to jump off the webinar, but I'm going to finish up with a few more slides. Um, so I'll share my screen really quickly to do that. So let me just get this in presentation mode. Okay. Hold on one second. OK. So thank you all for your questions. I'm just gonna go to the end really quickly. I apologize for that. Sorry about that. Okay. So um, a few of you mentioned the recording. So you will be sent, everyone who attended today's Questcast, or who registered will be sent the recording via email. Um, you can also find the recording afterwards if you go to our website, www.questbridge.org slash questcast. We'll post the recordings there and you can view them on our YouTube channel as well. Um, so I do wanna quickly introduce a few more Questcasts. So this was the first part of our college admissions summer series, really an introduction. And then the next Questcast will be the unspoken benefits of top colleges. 
So that will be next Thursday at the same time at 3 p.m. And you'll be able to hear from Crossbridge College partner representatives as they discuss some lesser known benefits of attending top colleges. Um, the following week, we'll have a questcast focused on financial aid. So you'll get to hear from financial aid experts on how attending a top college can actually be more affordable than attending a public state school or community college. Um, again, note that these will be taking place at 3 p.m. Pacific time, and you can register for them on our website at the QuestCast page. Um, we'll also, in the next week or so, our full false QuestCast schedule will be available, including registration links. Um, so you, I encourage you to visit at that time, as some of those QuestCasts we mentioned, including the introduction to the National College Match, or the college essay, um, a specific dedicated essay quest cast, and several other resources regarding the college, the National College Match application, you'll be able to find that full schedule and all the registration links at that time. And right now I'll go ahead, I noticed that the events didn't share with you, so I'll resend that link. Um, so I do encourage you to check that page out as well for some upcoming college partner events that you can attend as well to get to know those colleges a little bit more. All right, and that concludes our QuestCast. So thank you so much for joining. Um, if you have additional questions, you can visit questbridge.org slash askqb. There's a lot of different articles that you can find relevant to the National College Match application. Um, and for other upcoming webinars, again, go to that QuestCast page. Thank you again for joining. I hope it was helpful and I hope to see you next week.